Hello, and welcome to All Hands on Tech, where today's leaders talk tomorrow's technology. Most of us can't imagine creating one Pluralsight course, let alone a hundred. In this episode, author evangelist Greg Shields speaks with Jeremy about his incredible 100 course accomplishment, what paved the way to him becoming a Pluralsight author, and why storytelling is at the heart of everything he does. Uh, tell us about what you do for Pluralsight. Uh, so I am author evangelist here. I'm also a full-time author. Um, and that actually, it's kind of interesting because it kind of spans several different activities. Uh, most of what I do here as a full-time author, that portion of it is in just generating courses. And as you can see, obviously with the the topic for today's conversation, as, as many courses as possible. <laughs> yeah, lots of courses. Lots of courses. Uh, and the, we have a very, very small set of, of full-time authors that are on salary here, on staff here at Pluralsight, uh, in part because it gives us the opportunity to kind of work on some courses that sometimes we have difficulties finding people for. So stuff that may not be as, uh, as exciting to someone in the outside world. Uh, it also, the, the, the evangelist part of it, I think a lot of people kind of see the word evangelist and assume that it means product evangelism. And the evangelist part of this role, I guess, is more about, I usually say that the direction of the evangelism actually points into Pluralsight in that we, as authors, kind of embed ourselves in with the rest of the author community and there have an opportunity to kind of get a feel for kind of what's going on on the ground there with people. And yeah. then we can take that and bring it back inside Pluralsight when people have ideas or thoughts and just present ourselves as kind of an avatar of the author base. I can sometimes call us the canary in the coal, the canary in the coal mine for potentially really bad ideas. <laughs> <laughs> and so it gives okay. us an opportunity to, whereas sometimes it will be difficult to bring in outside authors just because of the relationship. It, it just gives us an opportunity to have product teams, for example, kind of ask us questions about what is it like to be an author? So the, the, the evangelist part, like I said, is kind of, representing the authors to the rest of Pluralsight. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. And I know that, that you also um, talk with authors a lot. Um, like before I was a full-time employee, I was in the author Slack a lot as an author. And I remember sending you messages and stuff and, and seeing things you're posting and you're kind of like a, a go-to person for the authors as well. I, I try to be when, you know, people do reach out and kind of back channel questions from time to time. And, you know, it's nice to be able to offer up a, a career's worth of experience and in, in building courses and courseware. And I, I guess I'm the Camtasia person. I tend to be the Camtasia evangelist too, I think. Uh, yeah, probably it, a little bit. Yeah. And it's always been informal, you know, um, sometimes people just have questions that they just, they can't get answers to through the usual channels. And sometimes it's nice to have somebody that feels like they're on their side too. So how did you get started in tech? Wow. That's, <laughs> Well, when I was eight years old, um, my grandmother's, I think my grandmother's boyfriend at the time brought us an Apple IIe. We were living out on a farm in the middle of, like, well, the middle of nowhere in Southern Illinois, 45 minutes from the nearest grocery store. And uh, he brought the family an Apple IIe. And I took to that like nobody's business. My dad used to tell me all the time, go outside. I'm like, no, you don't understand. I'm learning to code <laughs> in the 80s. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, I spent most of my time actually trying to get my video games to work on that machine without completely destroying my dad's accounting database, which I did and then undid several times. <laughs> so, so that was an early start there and just trying to make machines work and keep them running so that I wouldn't get in trouble from my folks for breaking the important things for them. I did a lot of work then in high school, um, managing the very nascent uh, network and network is an IBM based network operating system there that I don't think anybody actually knew how to run. And uh, so kind of got my feet wet there just because they needed someone to help figure out how to use a silly thing. Um, I, I actually got started in, in teaching back when I was in college completely by accident. There was a group of people, the um, CCSO, the Computing and Communication Services Office there in uh, the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, and they were like the computer people, and they happened to have a job opening to teach people Microsoft Office products on Mac. I applied for the job and got it. Let's see, that would have made me 
what, age 19, I think. And the job was to build courses, like entire lesson plans, to teach the staff, university staff and students, how do you do databases and how to do office products and all these sort of like introductory level things. And so I was reminded just recently that I guess I've been building courseware since I was 19 years old. <laughs> wow, that is pretty amazing. Do you think it's the the outside passion that that you kind of brought into it? Because my story kind of is very similar, actually. I, I grew up out in the country and my mom was an accountant and she had a computer at home. It was an old 286 and exact same thing. I was trying to run games on it. I was trying to do all these things. Wing without, Commander. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. <laughs> without, you know, trying to break the computer. And then when I did break the computer, it's like, oh, mom is going to be really upset. So yep. <laughs> I, I got to figure this out. And, and that, that kind of passion was the same thing. When I was in high school and college, I had all this outside passion that I brought in there. And it kind of led, you know, me being a go-to person also because I, I was just so passionate about it. And I would come in there and be like, yeah, I, I totally know how to do this because, you know, this is what I did last night for six hours or, or whatever. And, and do you think that, that that outside passion was kind of an early driver that put you into a position where you could, where you could teach others? I think so. I also, so a couple of stories people don't really know about me. Um, so I was heavily involved in the Kiwanis in uh, high school and college. And uh, actually in high school, it was called the Key Club. And in college, it was called Circle K. But it was all this community service kind of stuff. And uh, I, I just, I took to it also because we were, we were a farm family that kind of moved into the local town so we could get into the better school district. And uh, in there, I, I actually got myself into some of the leadership roles in both of those in high school and college. Um, in high school, I ended up being governor of Ele the Illinois Eastern Iowa District of Kamau of Key Club International, and oh, wow. somehow through a very long story, ended up being international secretary my junior year in college. So even at a very early age, I was traveling the country, giving speeches to people, you know, motivational speeches at the time on why community service was important and, you know, trying to motivate oh. people to, you know, to, to do things for their communities. Wow, that's really cool. It, it was. It was actually really cool from a very early age to have an opportunity to stand up in front of people, both peers and also, you know, regular you know, middle-aged people that were, you know, your, your adult Kiwanians and stand up there as a peer and talk to them as an adult and kind of get over that fear of audiences and learn how to communicate and learn how to transfer information and learn how to motivate. So that was... Um, I think also helpful in a lot of my later on career decisions and doing a lot of, you know, conferences and, and I've done hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of webinars <laughs> over the years. <laughs> yeah. Uh, not so much anymore, but back in the day. And then also these courses too, because that early start there just kind of laid the, the, the groundwork for understanding the art, I guess, of, of transferring information from one person to another. The, the other story that I don't think a lot of people know is, um, in college. So it, it just seemed correct to, for me to go into computer science in college. And I got into, like I said, the university of Illinois in their engineering program and I hated it. <laughs> it was, really? It was awful. I just hated it. And I, I actually dropped out of the C plus plus programming course twice because I couldn't figure it out and wow. uh, eventually dropped out of the entire program and got a degree in business. And oh, okay. yeah, and it, it turned out that I, the, the, the actual, um, the, the structures at the time of at least how the, the, that curriculum was, was built just did not grok with the way my brain worked. And so my formal education is about 50%, you know, technology, computer, computer science, like straight up computer science. And then about 50% or probably more the application of that into business, which as you might imagine, also kind of folds into, you know, I guess where I am today. <laughs> yeah, as I said, that probably helped tremendously for where your career trajectory ended up going. It's funny, I, you know, a lot of people, formal college kind of gets a bad rap these days because by some people, but still that four year experience, if it's something that you can, if you have the capacity to do, does expose you into different things that you might not necessarily have otherwise done, you know, like taking classes in marketing and taking classes in, you know, international business and things like that, that as a farm kid, 
Like that was eye opening to me. And I still use those skills today. Yeah, I could imagine. I, for me, it was economics. That was, <laughs> I, I would have never gone on my own volition and taken an economics course. But when I had to, I was like, this is amazing. <laughs> this, is, <laughs> this is the coolest thing, you know, and having a structure that you have to follow that's somebody else's structure that may end up working out well for you. I guess I keep telling people I keep falling into all these jobs, but I'm starting to think now that I'm just speaking the words out loud that maybe all of this actually, there was a progression <laughs> that I didn't even know at the time. So do you have any like crazy jobs that maybe helped with your current job? Like something you did a long time ago? Like I, I worked on a lumber mill for a short amount of time before college. And years later, it came back that I started to know some things about production you know, when I was thinking about DevOps and software delivery and things like that, there were some things that I learned about production in a lumber mill, turning logs into, into boards that nobody would probably think that had anything to do with it. You know, at the time I, I was, I was basically stacking boards as they came out of a mill, but I was learning about production and, and flow and things like that. Is there any kind of job that you could think of that's, you know, not related at all to what you're doing now, but kind of had an influence on it? Probably. Um, gosh, that's, I've, <laughs> for the longest time at the beginning of my career, I had all kinds of different jobs. I, uh, I did theater lighting and design for several years. Um, I ran the light rig for Bollinger Auditorium there at U of I did some sound. So sound engineering too, there for those guys, which involved, you know, pushing levers up and down on a board more or less. Uh, and I learned more about life in that job, I think, than anything else. I don't know if it involved much about what I'm doing today, but I, I learned a lot about just how life works in that job. Uh, so, so thank you to Tom Emanuel for um, hiring me. That was an <laughs> awesome decision on my part. And then <clears throat> after college, I didn't really know what to do with myself and ended up coming out here to Colorado, uh, worked at Dave & Buster's as a bouncer for a long time. Uh, also learned a lot about life there. Yeah, and ended up getting a job at Raytheon kind of just bizarrely um they were looking for someone to do documentation to essentially write these enormous documents that now we actually just build in code you know um but it would be like okay step uh, roman numeral two dot a dot you know uppercase one dot a dot four click next you know roman numeral two dot a dot lowercase whatever dot, dot, dot click next and it would be these hundreds of pages of documents because when you, when you build a satellite system, you have to have all the documentation for how to rebuild it because sometimes they go boom. And so I got hired essentially to build this enormous set of documents for like an ISO 9000 audit that was coming up. And uh, actually, I, I did that for several, for a long time, for months and months. And uh, the, I, was, I lived in the basement of a building with no windows. The building that we were in was designed to survive a near miss from a nuclear missile. No kidding. Uh, and so there were, it was a Faraday cage. The entire building was a Faraday cage. And so you, no radio got in. Like there were no signals that could get in or out. And there were no windows because at the time they didn't want you know, the bad guys looking in the windows and seeing what we were building. And our um, chief scientist came down. His name is Terry Plymel. And... Uh, he was talking about this new program that Raytheon had just won and how we needed to build 300 computers fast, which no one had ever done before because at the time, in order to build a computer, you put the DVD in the drive and clicked next and clicked next. And everything was not, not an automated very, process Very, very manual. I mean, it was the same documents that I was writing were the documents that people would use to build the computer, you know, click next, click next, and so on. I think I still have the... Uh, the um, the license key code for like Office 95 baked into my brain. At the time, <laughs> times. If you ever needed to install that, you wouldn't have to look it up. Yeah, exactly. Oh, one, one, two, three, oh, one. But, <laughs> but uh, so Terry came down and was telling this story about how we were afraid we were going to not be able to get this program started in time. And I said, Terry, I'll make you a bet. I said, I'll build you 300 computers in a month. And in exchange, you, you know, I'm going to need some software and some stuff. But in exchange, if you... If I, if I do that, if I build 300 computers in a month, you'll make me a systems administrator. And he looks at me and he's like, deal. All right. And uh, that was at the time when Ghost first was coming out. And no one at the company had heard of Ghost. And so I had. And uh, so we got a copy of Ghost and we got us a big rack with a bunch of cables on it. And we got those computers built about three weeks. And Terry's like, okay, here you go. You, you did it. And here's my... 
you know, here's my uh, part of the deal. And so I, we moved me out of the basement, the building with no windows. And he rolls me into the room with all the systems administrators, like the tier three crowd. And he's like, okay, everybody, this is Greg Shields. Um, he's your new system administrator. And they're all like hated on me at first. Cause I got to skip several levels because of this bet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's pretty cool. So like, we don't know what to do with you, but we'll find something. And eventually I became the guy in charge of terminal services. I don't know if that's a crazy job, but it was definitely a crazy story. That's kind of, ex, you know, drastically accelerated my career like a cannon from, from tier zero to, I guess, tier three, tier four, very fast. You've done a hundred courses for Pluralsight and I, I've also done courses <laughs> and at your, at your current rate to catch up to you, I would have to do it, I think for another hundred years or so, which isn't going to be possible. <laughs> but so I, my question is, how do you remain so productive when it comes to, to building courses? I imagine you have a ton of tricks and, and shortcuts. And actually I've, I've asked you for some of those <laughs> and, and received them. So I know you have some, but how do you remain so productive with building courses? Well, they, they keep paying. So, you know, I keep getting a, my, my, my check at the end of every two weeks, which is great. You know, again, being on salary. So that's the joke there is that yeah. you know, keep producing <laughs> courses if the, the check's still cash. In reality though, so like, it's really hard to say. And it's funny because here, both internally and then also to some of the ideas that we project to the other authors, it's funny for me sometimes because we project some of these formalized systems that I, I always kind of immediately in my mind reject until I realize, wait a minute, you're doing this anyway. You just don't have words behind it. Like um, last year at Author Summit, we were spending a lot of time talking about um, backwards focused design. And a lot of the the processes that go into backwards focused design. And I was like, this is silly. This is a really silly idea. And then I kind of sat down and thought about it. I'm like, no, you don't understand. You these sorts of things are things I think I've been doing from the beginning in just, just, just sort of figuring it out. But some people are finally putting words to or definitions around some of these tactics and in, in approaching these different concepts. So um, for me, exa for example, I always tend to have a pattern for the either a course or if I've got multiple courses on a learning path, there's always a pattern. It's always the same pattern, right? And uh, the pattern begins with, okay, here are a pile of Legos, right? And we have to get, that's at the very beginning. We start with nothing. If you can start with a series of Windows servers or computers, whatever the, the basic building blocks are to get something started, let's start with that. And at the other end, way on the other end is a fully functioning environment that you would feel comfortable rolling into production. So everything in between are the steps that you would go through to start with that pile of Legos and to end up with some, you know, thing that is ultimately working. Yeah. So and, it's like the picture of the moon lander. Exactly. You know, yeah. in Legos that yeah. you could look at. The Death Star. That's, you know, that's where we're going. Whatever, yeah. whatever thing that we're aiming to achieve. Now, in order to get there, whether it's one course or an eight course learning path, the, the, the steps are just, you take all that content. In your mind, if you just kind of chunk all that content out, so kind of break it apart into it's just individual things you have to do. And then I try to reassemble it together. This is a, this is my term, a term I use a lot. Uh, if you try to reassemble it back together into what I term a navigable storyline, right? So when the person is, is watching this, you want to tell a story, but you want to tell a story that they can navigate on their own because my assumption in all these courses is that you, the learner, are following along and doing all these things at the same time. Now, the, um, I guess the deal that I make with you, the learner, is that at no point am I going to do one of those and then a miracle occurs and like wave my hands over the screen and, you know, throw a puff of smoke and, you know, that kind of stuff. <laughs> yeah. Uh, because that's, that's my, I guess, social contract with you, the learner, is... Even if it's hard, I still want to show it to you because it's hard. So every time I'm building these courses, it's, that's exactly the same pattern for the courses. Here's a bunch of Lego blocks. There's where we're going. Now let me chunk everything out into a storyline that would make sense for you to do in that order. And eventually we'll get there. And so it's a, a little bit different than a, a tech demo, per se, like with a tech demo, you're trying to 
that's exactly what it seems like we're trying to do is get the puff of smoke and magic and look, oh, now we've got a bunch of containers and apps running in it. Isn't that magic? So, so it sounds like it's a different approach where it's like, here's the step by step. So this is exactly how you do it. And now you can do it right alongside. The the funny part, or I guess the, I guess the, the not very secret secret about this stuff is that we're not creating where we, we rarely create net new. Yeah. What we do, I, I, and I don't consider myself like an engineer or a creator. I, I, I'm a storyteller, right? I'm taking the content that you could probably access on your own. Like there's no, I'm not got any secret content here. All the stuff that even the knowledge that I pick up, the little details come from publicly available documentation. But sometimes reading that documentation is just brutal. As someone who reads a lot of documentation, yes, it can be brutal. And yeah. in, in a lot of cases too, it's not so much that the doc, yes, the documentation is brutal, but sometimes the people who write that documentation, they, they do the best they can, but it's fragmented. And you got to go to nine different places to try to assimilate together that navigable storyline. And so what I bring to the table, or what I think everybody here at Pluralsight tries to bring to the table is we, we take the information you could have got anyway and reassemble it back together into a navigable storyline so that you, the learner, can start with zero and go to whatever level you want without having to go through all the brain drain of trying to then reassemble this fragmented information because you probably just don't have time to do it. So I always tell the authors too, you know, when something is hard, show it. The value that we bring to people is um, – like this last, so these last three courses, the 98th, 99th, and 100th courses, there's like 12 different virtual machines that are required to get this thing running. And it took me about a day and a half just to build the environment, just the very basics of it. So yeah. in some cases, people aren't going to follow along, even if you assume that they do, but they want to be able to see something that would otherwise be really hard to, to see on their own. And so that's the value we bring to people is giving them the abilities to see these things that would be hard for them to mock up on their own and would be hard for them to reassemble together from all these different stacks of documents and best practices that are out in the, out in the industry. Would you say there's an element of triage there also? So if you're going through documentation, which, you know, anybody in tech has, has probably done this at some point where you go through every bit of documentation and there's just a pile of information and you use 30% of, of what's in there to do what it is that you wanted to do. So do you, do you think there's an element of triage there also that, that has to come in? Yeah, you do. I will say you do to get to certain points when you're like, yeah, we're just not going to talk about that. You know, yeah. and for me, it's not necessarily, it's, it, it's never about because it's too hard. It's a, it's, does it impact the storyline? So uh, example, right? So again, back to this last, these three, well, there's, we'll be four in this next learning path. But so the last time I did this, I attempted to follow the exam guide more, like very, very specifically. And I found that even though I was talking about these topics that were in the exam guide, they weren't all that interesting. And they pulled away from the, that narrative arc. And this next round, in addition to updating it to 7.10, um, what I also did was I also kind of trimmed out some of the stuff that didn't feel like it really, for, it, it didn't get the ball down the field better. You know, it kind of, it, it would, it felt like an aside as opposed to actually kind of um, furthering the storyline in the way that it should. So, you know, sometimes you tell a story and you have to tell it a couple of times in order to tell it correctly. I've told the VMware Horizon story for version, I think, four, five, six, and seven now. <laughs> so each time you tell that story, you kind of figure out a better way to explain some of those concepts or to reassemble those different chunks together. So a lot of your courses deal with things like VMware and a lot of virtual machines. What is your tech stack look like? Like I have a, a small server and I use uh, VMware Workstation uh, basically because I, I don't need anything super fancy for, for what I'm doing. But I, I'm curious for sure before going into this, like what does your tech stack look like? Do you have like a, a big bunch of racks? Are you doing things in the cloud or um, how are you spinning up these virtual machines and these networks and stuff? This is almost a political question. Like uh, there's, <laughs> there's like 10,000 ways that you can build your your lab environment and all of them are perfect for whoever each person it's perfect for them. And it's funny too, because recently on Twitter, um, I, I had 
there is a group of people that were kind of sharing their home labs, the, the bill of materials for their home labs. Yeah. And for some of it, it was sort of like a, you know, who spent the most money <laughs> conversation. <laughs> yeah. Because in some cases, there are people who are spending like five and six figures on home labs. And uh, yeah. early, early, early on, my wife was like, okay, so no server equipment because they're too loud. It's just too noisy. For I had a way early on, I had like an old throwaway piece of equipment that was a server that I think actually consumed more electricity than a refrigerator. Yeah. And I kind of got to the point where I'm like, this is, this just doesn't work for the rest of my lifestyle. So, um, Big shocker. I use one desktop. I have a single, wow. it's actually a six year old desktop. Pluralsight bought it for me uh, when I first started working here. I occasionally, my old desktop is actually still sitting in the other room, which once in a while, if I need the, the extra RAM, I'll power it on and connect the two together. But just about everything runs on one desktop. And here's why. So it was a couple of reasons, but number one is, is I'm lazy. <laughs> and number two yeah. is I'm cheap. When it comes to this kind of stuff, right? I want something that's going to be easy to easy to build and maintain. I want something that's not going to cost me a bunch of money because I respect entirely wanting to have a mock-up environment, especially when you're talking like virtualization stuff where you've got hardware interconnections you've got to be concerned with. But number one, I'm lazy. Number two, I'm cheap. But number three, and this is the more real of the three, is I want to build these courses in a way that somebody, a learner out there, could follow along, right? That's my rule. And if it yeah. takes more than what I can do on a desktop, a sufficiently powerful desktop, I'm always running out of RAM. I got 64 gigs yeah. of there. I could use 128, frankly. But <laughs> if, if I can't build this course on a off the shelf piece of equipment, then you can't follow along with an off the shelf piece of equipment. And that breaks my social contract with you. So I spend a lot of time, spend an inordinate amount of time trying to figure out how to squish all these simultaneously needed needing to be run machines onto a single machine so that you could do the same thing when you follow along. Like, like I said, I, I want you to be able to follow along. If I can't do it then you can't do it, then it's not fair to you. So, so that's okay. everything fits on a desktop. It's actually, I was one of those people that was tweeting out personal labs uh, last weekend and a couple weekends ago. And uh, in a way I put, I put my cost on there. As kind of a, to let people, I spent $400 on <laughs> the machine that I use for my lab. And I put that intentionally almost for the same reasons. Like you can build a lab without going crazy with it. You know, I bought this machine with 32 gigs of RAM and put Linux on it and VMware. And, and that was kind of my motivation. As I was sending the tweet, I'm like, maybe I should just put how much I spent on this. So people don't think, you know, that you need $5,000 to, to do virtualization or whatever. So. Mine is a, th this particular desktop is a little bit more expensive only because, um, well, plural site paid for it, <laughs> but it was also a, um, it's an ultra silent oh. machine, which is a game changer for when you're recording courses, like not having fans running is, is great because it gets them out of that, that audio. Yeah. Um, I have a room, we, 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 my wife and I built a house here about five years ago and I have a room that is covered in sound foam in the walls and then covered in sound foam on the walls to try to keep as much of the, the ambient noise out. Um, and then also, so not only to keep the outside noise out, but then we, we authors, anybody that's working in front of a microphone, um, reflectivity or echo is a real problem. And that is you're in a room that has walls at 90 degree angles to each other and your voice goes through the microphone bounces off the wall in front of you, hits the microphone again, bounces off the wall behind you and hits the microphone, you know, and it just keeps doing that. And yeah. we struggle with this all day long. And so room treatment is frankly as, as much or more important than the machines that you're working with. And so I've got some, in some cases, some nice stuff in some cases, some less than nice stuff here in this room as a, as room treatment for, when people are listening, we found plural sites found, I've found over the years that um, the number one turnoff for folks is when the audio is bad. Yeah. Yeah. If you hear echo, if, if, if I'm a little, my voice is a little chewy cause I just had eggs for breakfast <laughs> yeah. or whatever, <laughs> like yeah. all of those things, when you're doing this close mic, like intimate level 
like one-on-one sorts of things. Uh, those are really, really important for, for keeping people interested, especially when you're talking about a course that could be four or 24 hours long. That makes perfect sense. That was one of my biggest struggles as an author, probably with audios. I had done courses for a company and with, with that level, with the level that they accepted, I actually just had a headset and I was sitting in my cubicle at my desk talking and that was perfectly fine for all the courses I built. You know, they're internal only. Nobody really complained. Um, but as soon as I, I started doing courses for Pluralsight, you know, they're like, we need better audio. And, and so for me, that was a huge, huge jump where I had to spend a lot of time reading about it, researching. And then I, I had realized after a, a long period of time, actually, you were one of the people that I would bounce questions off of and several people, I realized that I didn't need to spend as much money on the equipment and have all the fancy equipment and super expensive equipment. The room treatment was what, you know, getting rid of those echoes and, you know, keeping sound out of the room and then keeping things from reflecting inside the room was far more important than spending a million dollars on a bunch of fancy equipment. And, and, and mouthwash, xylitol based mouthwash, which is great. <laughs> I just ate eggs for breakfast problem. That stuff is magic. Yep. <laughs> Absolutely. And uh, room temperature water with lemon in it. Is all these things. Are little... Got it sitting right next to me right now. <laughs> <laughs> as, as you're producing these courses, you're obviously producing them very fast. So there's, there's an element of, you know, the actual production and efficiency there. But how about learning the thing that you're teaching about? Do you have any, or any methods or tricks for that? Um, because, you, you know, you have to know the content to teach the content. And so you're, you're clearly ramping up on things and, and learning things very quickly in order to produce the course for them. Do you have any, any tips or tricks on, on learning things quickly? I'm going to share a little secret trick that I probably shouldn't share, but I will anyway. Um, if you're a learner, um, sometimes it actually is not only not important, but it's sometimes it's not, a, it's not even helpful for a person to be necessarily like a globally recognized expert in something to be good at teaching it. Personally, this is a personal opinion here, and it's been, I, I think other people are kind of coming around to this idea as well, but sometimes the, 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 the biggest experts in the world, when we were talking about insert name of technology here, sometimes the biggest experts in the world aren't that great at teaching it for one reason is that when you're such an expert in something, you forgot what it was like way back in the day to learn it. If, if you've been working with it so long, just that process of going from zero to one, not even to 10,000, but from zero to one, you've probably, it's been so long ago that you forgot some of the basic fundamentals of how you got from not knowing about it to how you got to knowing about it. I've got another term I've coined. I call it emergent instruction, yeah. which is a fancy term for there are times when I'm learning it as I'm teaching it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, my old joke is, uh, you know, the difference between a teacher and a student, don't you? No. About 24 hours. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I feel comfortable saying that because you asked the question about, so how do you learn something new? And then sometimes it's, you know, on the job training where the job is helping other people learn this stuff too. And this whole idea of emergent instruction, I think, is really helpful for, for people who, like for authors, for example, who are like, I'm a .NET person and I'm a .NET person. Well, if you're a .NET person, you could probably do some, I, I don't know that space, but you could probably, there are adjacencies to, to .NET that you might not necessarily know intimately, like deeply, but you kind of can, you can feel your way around. And so yeah. having a background a, a, at this point, a pretty deep background and a few key areas offers some adjacencies there for other kinds of things that, yeah, I haven't touched them before, but the process of me learning it and then talking about me learning it, as long as I've got all the chunks assembled in that navigable storyline, and as long as I do a good job of kind of just broadly looking at the, the thing to be built and then chunking it out and then lining them up in order. I don't, I, in a lot of cases, I don't have to be an expert. I'm just trying to get you from zero to maybe one or five or 10. We're not trying to go to 10,000 here. And so this process of learning new technologies, a lot of it is it's just sitting down with documents and thinking about them, like just, just thinking about them for a while. And, uh, Using that to, okay, well, if I were trying to learn this, in what order would I want to be introduced to what new things? Um, as, I, uh, as I continue to think about, um, you know, each new topic that I end up going down 
that path and ultimately sometimes teaching courses on it, a lot of it is. A lot of it is just looking at documents and saying to yourself, okay, as a person who is learning, what is the next thing that I'm interested in? Because the next thing that I'm interested in is probably the next thing that that person is interested in as well. Yeah. And that could be easily argued to be a, a better approach because if you're something like, say for me, I've, I've been writing C-sharp for about 10 years or so. So if I tried to do a beginning C-sharp class right now, how many things would I just assume that people know because I forgot that I didn't know it and learned it 10 years ago, <laughs> for instance. And so it could easily be argued that, you know, there's somebody out there who just started learning C-sharp who could teach it far better than I could because, you know, I'm not sitting there saying, well, what's this dictionary? How does this work? You know, that's not even entering my brain at this point. Whereas somebody who's new and starting out, it's like, what is this thing that he keeps mentioning this dictionary? What is that? Why does, why does that exist? You know? So, so yeah, you could easily argue that that would be a better approach just because of how fresh the, the information is and you know what to ask and what the why is behind certain things. So that's very interesting. Yeah, I've always here, here, both here, and I also worked for a, another company producing courses before Pluralsight, and I have always thought of myself as a storyteller. Like, there are a lot of different descriptors that you could have for what it is that you do. You know, I'm, I'm maybe not an expert in stuff. I'm probably not an expert in a lot of things. But what I am is a storyteller. And I, sometimes I think our best authors here, or really anywhere, are people that that really embrace the storytelling aspect of this. Um, they, they really, that's what really gets them up in the morning is okay. Well, well the process of telling the story, like just the, well, taking all those kind of dry things on paper and then turning it into something that's useful. That's what really gets them up in the morning. My, my wife always sort of chuckles because, you know, we'll meet people and some people will say, Oh, you should meet my friend. He's a big it person. You'll love him. My wife is like, yeah, he's almost not an IT person. He's more like a storyteller than an IT person. Yeah. So uh, yeah. that's the, I, I think that's the, the, the skill is in how to, how to tell stories. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I see that emerging a lot the last few years with all of the kind of things that I study. I'll study things on presentations, public speaking, um, course design, you know, all of these different things that I'm super curious about. And it all keeps falling back to that that story, you know, the hero's journey, things like that, and how story is tied to our survival in our brains. And it seems like that, that seems to be the number one piece of advice for producing any kind of content, whether it's teaching people things or, or even just writing a, a technical article is tying everything to that story. And so it seems like that's kind of the, the big chunk of advice to give anybody who's wanting to create things or teach things is, is start following that kind of story structure, like you're saying. So. Yeah, you tend to find here, so new authors, I think, sometimes fall into the trap of feeling like they need to be more formal than their regular everyday speech patterns. Just, yeah. oh my gosh, I'm in front of a microphone now and this is official, so I should I should talk formally. Yeah, <laughs> I'd still do that. Yeah. <laughs> my, my, advice for, my advice for new authors is get over yourself. The people, people that are here, I, I hope this is the case. I mean, people still watch my courses, so hopefully I'm an example here, but... <laughs> Kind of, you know, let loose. Not a lot, but, you know, formal sometimes is kind of a put off because it feels so formal. I had a professor in college who would read his lectures. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Type double space, they'd be 25 pages long, and nobody went to that lecture because it was just brutal. You know, take a step back sometimes. Just think about how you would want to be heard. Like, listen to yourself and go, hmm you know what? I'm not all that entertaining is <laughs> <laughs> if you don't pass your own smell test, then, uh, you know, people aren't gonna, aren't necessarily probably going to follow along too. Now that's not to say that they're, they're, you shouldn't have some formality in your speech patterns. Um, but sometimes kind of taking a step back can actually be useful here. Here's an example. So here's another. So if you're if you've actually gotten this far in this podcast, I will, I will share with you an excellent trick um, just a little tool that you can use to make yourself a better speaker. Okay. And we actually, my wife actually is when it came up with this idea years ago, we had, um, my old business partner and I had a project, big, big, big project where we had four or five different people recording these. I think they were like five or 10 minutes long 
these little instructional videos. And as part of the gig, we also had to transcribe them. So I, um, I hired my, my wife to do the transcription. <laughs> and uh, she says, you know, what's funny is, is when you transcribe somebody else's stuff or even your own, you can, there's kind of two different speech patterns that you hear, a lot of different speech patterns, but she broke it down into two. On one side, you have people who speak in complete sentences. And so reading what they, what they um, speak and writing or hearing what they speak, it sounds the same. And those individuals, when they're actually doing that, and so those people, when you hear what they're saying and you read it on paper, you can actually just see the sentences. And then you've got another group of people who, when you hear them, it's difficult to understand what they're trying to say. But then when you transcribe them, you hear two different competing voices and you have to use a lot of parentheses mm -hmm. or M spaces like the dash dash. So someone will say something and then the other half of their brain will step in and say something and then they'll back out and huh, that's very leave the sentence there. And uh, she said, she said, it's amazing whenever you're the person that's actually having to actively transcribe somebody's voice. So she said, you know what you got to do is have, we had four or five people. We had two that were okay and two that were good and one that was not so good. It was two that were okay, two that were not so good, and one was in the middle. She says, have those people transcribe their own stuff so that they can visually see how they speak. And I'm not kidding. All those, the, the three people that we had do that, did that, underwent that, that activity, that whole exercise, and immediately saw their speech patterns on the piece of paper. And as a result, their, their, the clarity of their speech improved immediately. Like it was night and day. It was impressive. And so the, I guess the, the exercise is if you want to become a better public speaker, find something to talk about. Don't, don't make a script or anything, but just stand up and talk about something you're interested in. And when you get done, don't do a lot because it takes a while to transcribe five to 10 minutes. But uh, when you get done, sit back down and listen to it and transcribe it onto a piece of paper, just as an exercise. And you'll find that you can visually see your own speech patterns then. And just the act of doing that a time or two will make you a better speaker. I'm going to try that. Absolutely. For myself. <laughs> so, I'm... If you find yourself needing like parentheticals and, you know, M spaces everywhere. Um, those are the things that you, you'll want to, like, if it's not comfortable to read, it's not comfortable to listen to. Um, what are you working on right now that you could tell us about? Yeah. The fourth course right now in this. So if the, the hundredth course, it's kind of funny. So there's so much press right now and it being the hundredth course that I don't want people to lose the fact that there actually is new three new courses yeah. on uh, VMware horizon, which is their VDI platform. And so the fourth course, the final course, arguably the, at least to me, the, the most interesting of the four courses is the one that's left to be done. It'll be kind of a longer one because I, I, I think I squished too much content into one course, but I had to do it that way. <laughs> Uh, so it's going to be one more, yeah. probably really long course there as number four to finish out that series. Uh, and then after that, um, I'm not entirely certain. There's a couple different avenues to go down um, for what the next thing will be. Lately, I've kind of been, uh, I, I've also been cheating a bit and asking Twitter if anybody has any ideas. And a lot of people have really great ideas that I hadn't thought about. So I might, you know. Is there a particular topic that you like a that you like to do a lot. They all have, they're all fun and exciting for different reasons for, the, for their own reasons. Yeah. Yeah. That's hard to say. It, it really is. I got one final question. Then this is a, a surprise pop question. <laughs> uh -oh. what, what's your favorite fiction book of all time? I'll start with a nonfiction book because you asked it. Probably the most, one of the most interesting nonfiction books I've ever read is a book called the ropes to skip and the ropes to know by R. Richard Riddy. Nice. And it's a book that was written in, it was written in 1994 and it was given to us in an organizational behavior class back in college. I still have, it. it's the only college text I still have. And, uh, it's, I thought it was just a really great, uh, I haven't read it in a really long time, but I thought it was a really great exploration of just why people behave in certain ways, behavioral psychology. And it's specific to how to, how to, you know, be in an organization. I, I, like I said, it's been a long time since I've read it and hopefully I'm not, and hopefully I'm, this is the right answer and it hasn't evolved poorly over the years. 
Um, but uh, that's one that I really appreciated back from college. As to fiction, that's 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 difficult, I guess. Um, uh, I have to say the uh, the Expanse series by James S. A. Corey is amazing. If you um, if you've read that or haven't read that, that's now currently a movie. No, it's a it's a TV series that uh, was canceled after the third season and um, Jeff Bezos over at Amazon liked it so much he bought it. <laughs> and then now it's run on the Amazon platform, uh, released by the Amazon platform. And uh, um, The Wheel of Time by Robert Jordan, that was a, uh, an amazing 12 or 13 book series that I started my sophomore year in high school and finally finished the last book several years ago, I think, because it took that long to get written. I believe, I believe it holds the record for the longest story wow. ever told. And I have heard of it before, but I haven't started any of the, the series yet. Might have to put that on my list. Give it a try. It's uh, it's worth a year and a half of your life. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. So is there anything that you wanted to talk about that I didn't ask about? I, I, w- I will talk about one thing. Um, one of the most bizarre parts about this job it's truly bizarre is there are, there's a lot of people that reach out and just say hello or say thank you or have questions or whatever. And it's, it is really cool. Like it is just to, like heartening um, to get these questions from people in sometimes really strange parts of the world, you know, the parts yeah. you don't even think yeah. of. Um, I was Facebook friends with someone who worked in the ministry of defense in Iraq for a while. I get oh, wow. emails from, you know, Pakistan. I get email or, or LinkedIn requests from those areas. I get people that contact me from just really, really interesting places. An uh, uh, individual reached out recently uh, from Giza and uh, had a question about, and I forget what the question was about, but it was a question about Citrix or something. And I said, can you see the pyramids out your window? And he's like, yeah, no, they're right across the street. It's amazing. <laughs> come on. Anytime we were in Giza, come stop by. <laughs> wow. And so just these, the opportunity to make the world a smaller place and recognize that even in today's day and age where everybody's, you know, talking about everything that at the end of the day, people still need to know how to make an active directory domain controller yeah. across the world yeah. is just a really amazing part of this job. Um, the other cool part too is a lot of these people don't know my face, but they know my voice and it's happened several times um, where I was at a conference or, or out bizarrely uh, across the street at my wife's, um, her community garden. And yeah. Someone heard me talking and stopped over and said, hello, um, you don't know me, but I know you. I've spent dozens of hours with you. I recognized you by your voice. Yeah, that's really cool. <laughs> I, I, I think I speak on behalf of all the authors here and, plural site that uh it's those it's those experiences that they don't happen very often but it's those experiences that uh are at the end of the day what gets you up in the morning gets you right back in front of that microphone to do it again because the, there are a lot of jobs out in the world that you know you're you're doing something you're contributing to something that maybe you don't really feel all that excited about but over here we get to do things and contribute to things that we know are helping people. Like we know that it's just genuinely a force for good. And yeah, I'm, absolutely. I will be for, I'll be forever grateful for the time I've had here because it is something that, you know, I can, I can tell my family and I can and hold my head up high and, re- and tell people, yeah, I'm, I'm here helping people and uh, I feel really good about it. Well, thank you for talking with me today. Yep. Thank you. Thank you for listening to All Hands on Tech. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider leaving us a review on your platform of choice. You can see show notes and more info at pluralsight.com slash podcast.